Yeah. Okay. Um, great. Uh, so, uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank um, Aramar Revi as well as uh, most of the IAHS uh, uh, team here for inviting me, helping me coordinate both uh, the trip, the, the time to talk here, and also the workshop uh, tomorrow. Uh, it's really great to get to present this work that I'm going to share with you uh, on the Ganga, um, this 10-year research project uh, on the Ganges water machine. So I arrived in the city of Allahabad, which is pictured here in northern India, over a decade ago. And uh, I, I arrived uh, not only to begin to map uh, and document changes uh, taking place at the confluence of the Ganga and Jamuna rivers, and unfortunately because we have the lights on, you can't really see, but... Uh, can we dim the lights just a little bit? Um, I guess these lights still are on, but that's fine. Um, uh, you, you can't really see it so well, but it's... Um, I, I, I put this image up front quickly because uh, here you can't so much see it, but on the right hand side is the Jamuna River and on the left is the Ganga and this is uh, at the Triveni Sangam in Allahabad where those two rivers meet and of course where uh, for some a third uh, river Saraswati meets like you can see on the image uh, on the left hand side thank you that's much better hopefully you can see it a little better and in many ways for me uh, the meeting of these two rivers uh, and where I was based and stayed for about off and on now for about 10 years uh, is in many ways a kind of microcosm of what I'm going to talk about over the course of this lecture, which is really this most sacred uh, site or this line, which is never really a line because it's constantly changing, is a model for the kind of mapping that I'm trying to do in this book and in this uh, research project. Uh, mapping not just uh, space, but also the choreography of water and how water transforms uh, this territory over time. And so this, uh, you know, this, this confluence uh, in many ways uh, encapsulates so much of what uh, I'm trying to do uh, in the book. Uh, but it wasn't also just to kind of map the uh, Ganga at the Sangam, but also to begin to map the Ganges River Basin by foot, boat, and car. I was armed only with a digital camera and handheld GPS. I thought it would take me uh, one year to complete, but instead it took me almost a decade uh, to do. Having written a Fulbright proposal uh, before Google Earth was launched in 2004, 2003 when I wrote the proposal. Uh, my proposal was quite simple. It was really that uh, give me one year to construct uh, what I was calling a dynamic atlas and I'll explain what that means in just a while. And that I would not only map uh, this unexampled landscape but map how it changes over time. So the idea of a dynamic atlas would be to bring uh, the dynamism of, of, the, of the river, of the basin, but not just of water, but of how people adapt to it, how people shape that uh, water and this river basin over time. And so both two types of time were that I was going to map, which was one was historical time, so how something changed over time, say in a linear way from the 19th century onward, and the cyclical changes that happen every year with the arrival of the monsoon. So, um, I was quite surprised when I actually got the Fulbright that they would give me a grant to walk the land uh, for a year to map the river, but they did. Uh, and I even got GOI approval, which was also really surprising because most of my colleagues who were working on water at the time uh, didn't. Um, so today I'm just going to speak about a small fragment of the 25,000 photographs that I took, the 15 sketchbooks, the 1,000 plus uh, journal entries and the 350 so maps that I made over this decade-long project, which has taken the form of many uh, mediums. One is uh, in the form of op-eds for the New York Times and the uh, Indian Express uh, here in India to a traveling exhibition, uh, which hopefully will come here to Bangalore at some point, uh, hopefully at IAHS, uh, to also a book which I hope can serve as a guidebook for the efforts underway both by the government of India and the billion and a half dollars from the World Bank uh, to try to clean up uh, the Ganga, which that I'll uh, speak about uh, in just a little while. 
But beyond the urban density of Mumbai and the technology centers of Bangalore like we're in or Hyderabad lies the Ganga River Basin, a fertile alluvial basin of some 1.1 million square kilometers in area, which is today uh, home to over uh, one half of, uh, uh, almost one half of India's billion plus population. And of course this uh, river basin doesn't just sit within India, it crosses into Bangladesh, Nepal, as well, uh, and it's not only uh, one of the most densely populated river basins in the world, but undergoes radical shifts every year, as all of you know, with the monsoon. Uh, and despite uh, this population density and radical changes every year, it also remains agriculturally, agriculturally productive. And in many ways, that's what brought me to come to India, was that I wrote this Fulbright proposal saying, this area hasn't been mapped in over five decades, comprehensively. Uh, all that I can find is that it's the most densely populated river base in the world and remains agriculturally productive. What does it, uh, a territory like that look like and what would it mean to try to map uh, an area um, uh, of, that, of that density and also diversity? So the, the work that I'll show you really goes from a really macro, almost celestial scale, like the ways in which you can see here that the southwest and northeastern monsoons work, uh, how they uh, enter and exit uh, the subcontinent and also in relationship to Southeast Asia as well as uh, its relationship uh, to the edges of Africa that you can see on the western side of the globe down below. Uh, the, the book and the talk will really focus on the intersection of the monsoon population density and agriculture. And this work then is an atlas uh, of unbuilt projects and built projects designed to transform the Ganga Basin. And since the middle of the 19th century, this water course has functioned as a laboratory to test and build a new civilization around water culture and uh, or water management. It's jointly authored by uh, human actors and their shifting natural heritage. And today the Ganges River Basin is a colossal machine in which the entire basin functions as a highly engineered hydrological supersurface. And that supersurface is what I'm uh, picturing here for you in this uh, exploded axonometric drawing. So at the bottom is, um, is the uh, Ganga Basin uh, with both rain-fed and uh, irrigated agriculture uh, kind of placed all on top of one another. The second layer from the bottom is the basin itself. This, the third is the rain-fed uh, agriculture in this area and the top is the irrigated agriculture. And uh, as you can see, this uh, level of irrigated uh, agriculture really extends all the way from connecting with the Indus uh, River Valley um, or Indus uh, Basin up here all the way really to the Bay of Bengal. So it's not only that it's hyper, uh, hyper dense, hyper agriculturally productive, but also hyper engineered, uh, which I call a kind of super surface one of the most uh, engineered uh, landscapes or surfaces on the planet. And so the surface has been constructed from innumerable, innumerable uh, infrastructures like the Ganga Canal, uh, like you see here, to myriad uh, tube wells and uh, hand pump infrastructure like you can see here. And because of this mixture of uh, uh, actors, the scale of inhabitation and the widely varying techniques of interventions, visualizing this landscape requires a uh, of, of infrastructure requires a different kind of atlas. And so this atlas uh, takes into account both this infrastructure as a kind of focal point, but also then, as I mentioned before, the changes that are taking place here. So since 1854, when water from the Ganges River was first redirected into the Ganges Canal, irrigation has reshaped the built environment of the Ganga Basin. Over the past 160 years, the main trunk and branches of colossal canals have been cut through cities and hamlets, uh, brick-lined water tanks were embedded deep in the ground to capture rainwater and countless small diameter uh, tube wells, hand pumps, etc. have been connected uh, to this vast uh, uh, groundwater infrastructure that exists within the basin or what one engineer in the middle of the 20th century called India's silent Saraswati. Um, these interventions have served in turn to reorient people's uh, uh, thinking about the environment. The irrigation infrastructures transform spaces from home to the region, often in unforeseen ways. They fostered agriculture and factories, hydroelectric dams, transportation, and new patterns of settlement, uh, while further blurring the distinctions 
between Burl and Urban. In 1950, India was not only independent from British imperial rule, but uh, her leaders uh, encouraged the proliferation of irrigation infrastructure far beyond the ambitions of the imperial regime. Forged in the crucible of colonialism and nurtured by the new republic, these canals, tube wells, and adjoining buildings, roadways, and uh, railways have become something entirely new. Now, of all the ways one might qualify this new space as rural, urban, landscape, drawscape, or city in Nicolopolis, None of these accurately define such elaborately engineered spaces and infrastructures. Even a sociological term such as rural urban, uh, first used by social scientists in the 60s to describe continuities between cities and villages, does not adequately identify the conditions of the, Gun of the Ganga River Basin. So uh, instead, uh, what I argue is that from the foothills of the Himalayas to the Bay of Bengal, the Ganges water machine cuts across agricultural fields, cities, and towns, and hamlets, inscribing in its monumental reorganization of space and infrastructure a new way of life. Throughout this uh, transformed river flowed the forces of tradition and innovation, dotted by diffuse uh, urban settlements, uh, urban projects, uh, such as regional capitals, um, like you see here with uh, Allahabad and Varanasi, which will appear in the kind of second half of the, the talk, to uh, tent cities like uh, the Kumbh Mela and Magh Mela, which um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with, to of course in the miniature uh, infrastructures of tube wells, and then again this colossal uh, uh, Ganga, uh, Ganga canal system. Now, its spiritual uh, and religious significance inspired reverence and pilgrims and still does to this day. Its archeological uh, and architectural monuments attracted uh, those in search of the picturesque, and its seasonal ebb and flow of water perplexed farmers and engineers alike. And its fast-paced urbanization uh, has vexed geographers, planners, and architects. In short, the physical and cultural <coughs> complexity of this territory uh, has challenged traditional terminology. Now, despite the remarkable background, uh, the infrastructural projects of the Ganga River Basin have received compar comparatively little uh, study with a few notable exceptions. And the most notable, uh, I would argue, is one from 1975. It's a paper written for Science uh, Magazine by Roger Revelle, who was uh, head of population studies at Harvard and co-authored with uh, a professor named uh, V. Lakshmi Narayana, who taught at IIT Kanpur in civil engineering. And what they do is they take all of the disparate uh, infrastructures that I just spoke to you about, about the tube wells, the canals, but also the groundwater uh, uh, systems, as well as the surface water systems and the monsoon, and they speak about all of that together as one giant water machine. And in fact, they speak about it as not only one organic uh, water machine or, or giant uh, machine, but that uh, this machine uh, is one of the most uh, fecund and greatest resources of the, of the, of the globe yet it's underutilized. And so their argument throughout this paper was not so much about how do you go about uh, spatially organizing this, uh, this machine to better utilize groundwater, surface water, and monsoon. So it's almost like if you think they, they're cutting a section through the earth and thinking about this machine as having these layers that go all the way up uh, to the kind of celestial level of the monsoon. But instead of thinking about that spatially, what they instead do is because this is a technical paper, they produce all of these equations that, uh, of course, many of you who come from the social sciences are probably very familiar with. But what this book does, uh, this book on the Ganges water machine, which I take the title from, is an interpretation of that machine. But it's the, the river basin that was transformed in one of the most engineered spaces on the planet. And it draws together the moving parts of the machinery outlined by Ravel and Lakshmi Narayana. But it also looks at the individuals and stories that contributed uh, to the construction of this robust matrix of population density, monsoons, and agriculture. Now, part of this involves what novelist Joseph Conrad called map gazing, which brings what he said brings the problems of the great spaces of the earth into stimulating and directive contact with sane curiosity and gives an honest precision to one's imaginative faculty. So, one of the things that I do in this, in this book and, and uh, in the maps is really try to undertake this idea of map gazing, but to another level, almost as a, a, an hallucination upon um, mapping and of visualizing this territory, hopefully in new and unexpected ways. 
So this book then, an atlas, a dynamic atlas of the Ganges machine, is a collection of transects that expose the juxtaposing layers of infrastructure and adjoining built forms. Now creating a dynamic <coughs> atlas is also a meditation uh, on taking measure and expanding the notion of what an atlas means. Now fortunately, I had some references uh, to help me develop before hitting the ground in 2005. And as I mentioned to you, uh, when I first uh, got to India, um, Google Earth had just been launched in 2005, uh, and when I went looking to find out if I could find any maps, uh, any kind of contemporary maps, uh, oftentimes if I wasn't uh, immediately asked if I worked for the CIA or some other kind of uh, scary acronym-based uh, institution of the U.S. government, I was just then told, well, you can't see these maps because they are... Um, that there, there are security concerns with having access to them, and uh, you know, even, uh, even if we could show you them, you could never possibly scan them or, or, or use them in any, uh, in any way. And I, I eventually came to find out that the maps that, uh, say, the Survey of India had were actually the same maps that I could find at Pusey Library at Harvard University that dated from the 1960s and 70s, and of course, printed on the very top was not to leave the country. Um, so. Even though I didn't get to see these, still I was able to make these maps, but, uh, or, or, or I, I was able to make my own set of maps just by walking the earth, but of course, trying to do that is a, is a gigantic task, and so I looked to a few ways of trying to, to start from zero in terms of how do you start to map a territory like this, and one of the most useful uh, references that I was able to find was a project that was done by uh, Marcel Duchamp, uh, a French artist uh, of the early 20, of the first half of the 20th century called Three Stoppages. And what Three Stoppages is, is that he took uh, this idea of, of a standard measure that we all take for granted, say the meter stick. And what he did was he took that meter stick and instead of uh, thinking of it as a fixed entity, he transformed it in so that instead of it being uh, a hard rod, he in instead took a piece of string that was a meter long and dropped it three times. And you can see, you can barely see it in this image, but these three black images below are actually those pieces of string. And then what he does is he cuts into an actual meter stick the line of those uh, three different meters. And what he shows is that there's actually, by changing the state, of the meter, you can actually get an infinite number of meters. And why I find that fascinating is, is that this kind of change of state from thinking of a hard rod as the meter, but instead to one that's flaccid, you can actually have myriad uh, meters, and that the, what we oftentimes take for granted as a, as a non-negotiable entity is actually highly subject to, um, to how we might start to rethink and rationalize it. And if that's a kind of... Uh, a kind of playful take on measure, there's also um, a really fantastic uh, book of hours that was created in the uh, early 15th century uh, for the Duc de Berry in, um, in France uh, at the time. And why I, why I find these images and this book of hours really fascinating is that uh, it's a book of hours in relationship to the zodiac. So in, this, uh, in these drawings, what's, or these paintings, uh, or illuminated manuscripts, what's great is that uh, they take place at 12 different times of the year. There's a kind of pictorial pre-Renaissance -re uh, notion of perspectival space that's happening in the bottom of each of these images. And as you can see, they're indexing not only changes in the landscape, but the ways in which people inhabit that landscape. But it's not only that there's a kind of change pictorially happening in the bottom half of the drawing, but then it's also always placed in relationship to the zodiac. So there's a kind of notion of cyclical time that's happening where you have a, chor a choreography, a chor uh, where you're mapping time or giving time a graphic both in a kind of pictorial space, like say pre-photograph, and then in a much more abstract uh, kind of diagrammatic space on top. And it's the bringing together of these modes of, of uh, drawing and imaging from Duchamp's three stoppages to this kind of uh, bringing together different modes of representation onto a single picture plane that really is, uh, drives the focus and the mappings uh, of this project. Now, um, the book is subdivided into these six transects or, or t these transects that cut across the entire basin. And I'll speak mostly about the six transects that I uh, derived or developed between the cities of Allahabad and Varanasi. Uh, the, the book as a whole go, starts all the way from Gangotri Glacier uh, at Gomuk and uh, ends or terminates all the way at the city of Varanasi. 
uh, although my research actually extended all the way into Bihar because the book uh, was already, s it was on over twice what it should have been in terms of what I agreed upon with the publisher. I couldn't uh, include an extra 100 pages on Bihar, so I had to stop at 400 and ending at Varanasi. But Varanasi is a great place to end, uh, especially in terms of giving you a sense of the measure of this landscape. So these are four photographs taken over the course of uh, four days uh, in October of 2005. And you can see just even in these two images how the river goes up and down. But it's not only just that the river is going up and down, but it's also depositing silt on the banks or on the ghats uh, that you see here at Mirgat in Varanasi. And I really like these images, not only because they show the ways in which people inhabit this edge differently just over the course of four days in terms of the, the water, but also that you, it's quite uh, visceral, the levels of silt or of uh, soils that are moving through this, uh, this water uh, body and not just purely water. And if that's not only kind of at a more intimate scale, the level of hydrological activity, especially in the state of Uttar Pradesh and, and now also today, uh, since it's been bifurcated into uh, Uttarakhand as well, uh, makes it incredibly uh, rich in terms of trying to understand this larger, almost state provisional, uh, uh, provincial scale all the way down to that much more intimate scale of change that happens throughout the basin. So the, the, the work of the Ganges water machine, it, it really begins in the 1850s with the construction of the Ganges canal system uh, and extends all the way to the present with the tube well revolution, which is oftentimes associated with uh, the green revolution, but actually precedes it by quite, quite a few years in the context of uh, northern India. And it's the blending together of these infrastructures of the monumental, say, canal systems that you have and the much more decentralized or rightly called convoluted tube well system that you have here. And while usually uh, someone might speak about this as a kind of succession of infrastructures, so say in the 19th century we have these giant canals, by the late 19th, early 20th century we start to see the centralized uh, tube well system. Um, what we look at is that while the kind of succession from uh, colossal to miniature, uh, it's actually the intersection of these infrastructures that makes this uh, supersurface active and what really constructs the Ganges water machine, not just in terms of what Ravel and uh, Lakshmi Narayana were talking about, but also the kind of spatialization and the water dynamics of, of this territory. So uh, instead of just telling that linear story, um, it, it also involves a kind of another scale or level, which is say from uh, the <coughs> mega pumping stations like you find here at Naranpur pumping station outside of uh, Chunar in, um, in UP uh, to the Ganges River Basin um, is best viewed as five distinct modes of irrigation, which are rivers, canals, or nalas, ponds, tanks, and uh, tube wells. And at different times of the year, these infrastructures compete, they coexist, and occasionally feed off of one another. A cut through these five layers reveals a lamination of infrastructural ideologies born out of the discontinuities of politics, bureaucracies, and cultural practices. And even though these ubiquitous infrastructures affect millions in their daily lives, there is no map that legibly renders their built reality or the relationships that they produce. Now, it might be worth asking, uh, what, what use are detailed cartographic maps of a territory transformed into a machine? Geographers and surveyors and hydrographers are not trained to draw plans and sections of machines. This is uh, the job of engineers and architects and landscape architects. And this, is this perhaps why the Survey of India has not mapped this hydrological supersurface in over 45 years? I have to wonder, did every survey general and each generation of bureaucrats agree that static, stale cartographic conventions of representation would not compete with infrastructure embedded in the ground? Now, obviously, who can say? But for a dynamic basin such as this presents many challenges to cartographers and physical geographers. Even in an age of GPS and GIS, the Ganges River Basin remains uh, wholly uncharted. And if this supersurface is still in need of an atlas, an almanac hybrid, a kind of dynamic atlas, then this dynamic atlas, once drawn, should yield criteria for design and engineering that is at once dynamic and stable. And there are a number of ways that I could have started to go about mapping the dynamism of this uh, river, of the system, uh, over time, uh, you know, 
kind of uh, the floods, the droughts, uh, as, as one way to kind of focus on it, uh, trying to understand this uh, region in a state of crisis, say, in a kind of news cycle. But instead, what I argue in the book is that there is both that kind of fast change that's taking place in, a, say, a state like UP, where UP has the most drought-prone uh, districts as well as the most flood-prone. There's a kind of uh, news cycle like uh, or disaster uh, uh, notion of how these spaces operate, but there's also a slow motion change that's taking place in this area that has to be captured through measured drawings. Because while there's both uh, the, the kind of the, the disaster notion of crisis, there is a slow motion crisis that's taking place that's been taking place really since the 19th century and trying to understand and measure and understand the spatialization of that crisis is critical, especially as uh, the government goes forward with trying to address some of the, the issues facing uh, the Ganga Basin. Now, um, without exception, the development of the Ganges machine, um, of course, undertakes exploitation of crisis and trauma. And uh, what I try to do is understand or relate that uh, within this notion of a transect. And the transect comes or really is developed by Alexander von Humboldt. And this is an image of a transect at the tip of South America that he did in the late uh, 18th century. And what's, again, nice about this, if we think about the Limburg brother drawings and, uh, and some of the others that I showed, is there's both a kind of planimetric view that's happening in this transect, where he's showing uh, a kind of almost cartographic map type of space here. But then he's also showing a sectional kind of space as well, and the microclimates that happen in these elevations. So instead of just thinking about space in a kind of flat 2D area, he's really thinking about microclimates and maybe how you start to engage section and elevation over time. And this notion of the transect then gets taken up by Patrick Geddes, who does a lot of that work here in India in the late 19th, early 20th century, and then also by landscape architects in the US uh, and elsewhere, like Ian McCarg, uh, to develop that further. I hope that I take this transect even further and not just try to map out uh, the kind of microclimates, but also place it in relationship to a single solar cycle, which I'll show you in just a moment in terms of how this notion of the solar cycle, like with Limburg brothers uh, mapping out uh, time, how you can start to use uh, the Earth's rotation about the Earth as a measure of time to better understand the, the cyclical changes that happen here. Now this is one of the best maps that I could possibly find when I, uh, in my traversing of the entire uh, Ganga Basin. And in fact, it's, of, uh, it's a map of um, hydrological activity in UP, uh, Himachal Pradesh, and uh, Haryana. And it's actually at a guest house um, in, uh, along the western Yamuna Canal outside of uh, Delhi. And of course, this is cordoned off. You can't actually access it. And even even in this image, you can start to see the level, and unfortunately it's not that clear, uh, the level of um, infrastructural excess that's been created even along the Yamuna River, which is of course part of the Ganga Basin. And even when I was trying to find maps, the times that I could gain access to maps, I could easily find maps of cities, like say of Patna here. But it was always the spaces outside of cities that proved the most difficult for me to find maps. And uh, what I came to realize both through uh, my constantly being asked if I worked with the CIA or the inability to uh, see uh, high-res images of the Ganga Basin on Google Earth because in fact India took more of an issue with Google Earth compromising national security than even the state of Israel at the time so when I was even when Google Earth was launched it was super low resolution and you couldn't hardly make out anything in this area was that it's actually the supposed spaces that are outside of the traditional consolidated city that are the most politically and spatially contested parts of the Ganga Basin, which in fact are also where some of the largest amounts of uh, hydrological infrastructure are placed within the country and the state. And here again, this was the best satellite image that I could get of, say, a city like Allahabad, where you can see, even just from this, it's quite useful in the discoloration of of the imagery, the, the, the braiding of the Ganga River, which you see up at the top, and then it does this immediate right turn and comes down and meets the Yamuna River, that even with the Yamuna, you can see how it's quite uh, graded in its banks. It's not uh, moving that much, whereas the dynamism of just the Ganga up at the top and the way in which the city of Allahabad is pulled back to allow for that dynamism to happen gives a sense of the animation that takes place in this territory. 
and even more so at the Triveni Sangam, uh, where the two rivers meet. Now, to give you a sense of just that I'm not pulling your leg about how the level of uh, infrastructural excess, if you were to say take the Amazon basin and subdivide it like I did with the Ganga basin before in terms of rain-fed irrigation, which is that uh, uh, rain-fed ag agriculture, which is the red um, uh, layer second from the top versus the irrigated that you see at the top, that almost the Amazon basin has very little uh, irrigated agriculture. If you look at the Danube, even though there are pockets of irrigated agriculture, for the most part, it's rain-fed. If you look at the Nile, the Nile, uh, the infrastructure or irrigated areas are s hug the river so tightly that they don't even really appear in that top layer. The Indus Basin, of course, starts to really appear uh, similar to the Ganga Basin in terms of its hydrological activity. Uh, like you can see here, the rain-fed versus the irrigated. But it's really the Ganga Basin that commands some of the greatest amounts of uh, hydrological activity. And, I mean, you can see in this map, I hope, finally, somewhat clearly, that really, all the way from, and this is the Indus uh, system here, that this is one gigantic hydrological supersurface constructed. And oftentimes, when we speak about these areas, both historically and even contemporarily, we, we oftentimes talk about this space as being atemporal, as not being sites of supposed development or modernity, but in fact, this is one of the most hyper-engineered uh, surfaces on the planet, and not only that, one of the most densely populated as well. And if that's not enough, then beneath that hydrological supersurface, or what that hydrological supersurface floats on, is uh, an incredible groundwater potential. And in fact, uh, the Ganga Basin has the greatest groundwater potential of any river basin in India. So groundwater potential, you can see for the whole uh, Indian subcontinent, or at least for this country of India, at the bottom, and then the Ganga Basin exploded up above. The darkest purple is where you have the greatest potential which means that it's not only that you have all of this surface water that's happening across this surf, uh, hydrological supersurface, but you have this groundwater. And the tube well not only uh, takes advantage of that, but transforms this groundwater into a kind of continuous, invisible infrastructure that's uh, literally running beneath the entire, entire basin and is also both uh, uh, a culprit and also a kind of um, an infrastructure to be celebrated in terms of the the forms of urbanization that are taking place across this territory. So bringing back that kind of celestial and terrestrial layers together, as I mentioned before, the monsoon, the way that that shapes this space, this is how the southwest and northeastern monsoons enter and exit India. And what I do is I cut sections through the winds themselves. So each of these radiated uh, pieces that you see on the left and right hand sides of the subcontinent on the top, these are actually sectional cuts through the wind uh, patterns that are that are taking place in their averages so that you can get a sense of the velocity and the diversity of these uh, these systems as they operate those of course uh, uh, those winds uh, bump into uh, the Himalayas that are to the north and so these six or these five um, section cuts or profiles cut through the Himalayas all the way to uh, the Indian Ocean and Bay, and Bay of Bengal see so the wall that's created by uh, the Himalayas and the the alluvium that passes uh, from these or is shed from these is is uh, is one of the most excessive uh, in the world. Over 800 million uh, tons of, of alluvium pass through here every year, just from the Himalayas um, into the Ganga Basin. And I take those sections and I not only then think about them as a kind of fixed spatial entity, but then I map out the different rainfall patterns in relationship. To, uh, the, to a single solar cycle to capture how the monsoon disperses these waters. So here you have those same five sections over the course of a single solar cycle. And I'll zoom in a little bit here so you can see the way in which uh, water, the, 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 uh, the ways in which uh, water is uh, dispersed across this landscape in relationship to the section. So at the top you have the actual profile of the land and then below you have the amounts of water that are happening um, in red in each of these time uh, zones uh, within the course of a single solar cycle. So trying to relate both the kind of physical lay of the land in relationship to the dynamism of water and rainfall. And this drawing is maybe a little bit more explicit. 
in terms of how the monsoon enters and exits, uh, or monsoons rather, enters and exits the subcontinent in relationship to a single solar cycle. So using the equinoxes and solstices as points to reference how it both moves in plan and in section. So here in plan, how it enters the subcontinent and then exits, and then also, unfortunately, the resolution isn't high enough to see how that then happens over the course of a single solar cycle in section as well. Bringing that solar cycle also into play, not just in terms of agricultural production, uh, here measuring um, the kind of, uh, say, sugarcane, cotton, uh, rice, pulses, etc., that are uh, harvested over the course of a year in relationship to rainfall, but also in relationship to the solar cycle and lunar cycles in terms of cultural events. So really trying to bring these changes of state that happen both with the monsoon in terms of, say, solid liquid to gas, uh, within this landscape, but also changes of state, both culturally, politically, socially. Perhaps the Kumela is one of the best examples of that, but there are myriad others that happen all throughout the basin. And despite the fact that I couldn't find very many good, uh, or I couldn't find any maps at all, right, uh, I actually found the uh, calendar art that I was coming across in places like Allahabad, Varanasi, Hardwar, extremely helpful because here you have a real bringing together of celestial and terrestrial layers, now albeit of a very particular kind, but I very much like these images because I think they also show how so many people, especially Hindus, uh, understand this uh, sacred geography. So they, many people I would meet never really think of this river as a continuously flowing uh, body of water, as of course most of you uh, know so many people do and maybe some of you also don't, but instead think of it as uh, a set of terrestrial sites imbued with celestial significance. And this celestial significance, I think, comes across in relationship to its terrestrial significance really quite nicely in these images where you have both Akbar Kila and various mandirs pictured on the left-hand image along with uh, the goddesses uh, Yamuna, Saraswati, and Ganga, as well as, of course, here on the right-hand image with people bathing at the bottom with Hanuman and Krishna in between, and then uh, the goddesses again up above. And for me, these are the closest doppelgangers that I could find to, say, the Limburg brothers' drawings and mappings of uh, changes that were taking place um, within the Duc de Berry's territory in the 16th century. And I ultimately find that calendar art or uh, bazaar art far more useful than maps such as this that I think really explain and show this territory as being a, a static entity. UP. Uh, for me, is in many ways like a second home because I've been coming and going and mapping this area for 10 years now, but it's also a fantastically fascinating space just because if you were to take it and compare it to other countries in the world, it'd be the seventh most populated. Um, you know, it has uh, 200 million people as of 2011 living in an area the size of Great Britain. Uh, you know, Brazil, uh, which uh, just trails uh, UP in terms of its population, whereas it has eight and a half million square kilometers, UP has less than 240,000. Um, it, it, it places not only pressures uh, on, on, uh, on water, but also ultimately, and especially today, extreme pressures on land, where in fact in many parts of UP, land is the greatest, or the most scarce resource, even more so than water. Now, if you would imagine and pl play a game where you said, okay, I'm going to move uh, all of the people of UP to the north, uh, like in this uh, diagram here on the left where you see UP, all of the black uh, is uh, land that's inhabited or supposedly urbanized, and the white is what's agricultural. So if you move them to the north, put them in the center, m put them into a rectangle, or did a kind of Australian model at the bottom, you see the relationship of agriculture to uh, settled areas. So, of course, UP doesn't look anything like that. Instead, it's this kind of mosaic that exists there. And that mosaic is quite unique uh, to India because of the ways in which it uh, undermines differences between, say, city and uh, rural countryside, um, and these kind of common divisions that we oftentimes use to describe these areas, both, uh, I'd say, amongst practitioners, government officials, and, uh, and academics as well, that if instead we think about defining urban and rural in terms of provision of infrastructure, what I hope to show you is that actually many of these supposed cities in UP are becoming more rural, and the supposed countryside is actually urbanizing even more in terms of provisions of infrastructure. Now, 
those kind of states that I show you in terms of, um, of, uh, of, of that mosaic, this is just a kind of broad spectrum of those of just one square kilometer each. And of course, this is only gonna get more intense as UP is expected by 20, 2025 to have 270 million people living in it if, uh, if uh, those projections are, are, are correct. Now, the, the formation of this supersurface uh, is both tied to five-year planning, but UP and especially the Ganga Jamuna Doab is kind of ground zero for the development of this. If you were to take in the same way that I had shown, uh, placing all of UP's uh, population in the center, imagine instead taking all of its irrigated area and placing it in the center over time from pre-independence, which is on your far left, to the late 1990s. You see the growth of irrigation that's happening in the state and of course it's even more than that in terms of uh, areas that are irrigated especially today and uh, that th those changes in irrigation they're not only just happening in terms of the canal system but also the introduction of the tube well and so here I'm breaking it down in terms of the the amount that's supposedly irrigated by the canal and that's also irrigated by the tube well now both of these are quite false actually in terms of separating them because uh, canals, especially unlined, which many of the, the, uh, the, the branches of the Ganga um, Canal in particular are unlined, they actually leak water which gets into the groundwater table level and oftentimes raises uh, groundwater table levels. So there's actually more conjunctive or, or um, uh, interlinking that's happening between these two systems. But whereas the canal inscribes these monumental corridors, uh, like you can see in the left, uh, top left there uh, as a kind of line, the tube well instead creates a kind of diffuse dot-like system that happens throughout the landscape and it is leading to a diffuse kind of urbanization that's taking place all throughout the basin, both in cities but also especially outside them, supposedly. Now the UP sits on uh, quite a bit of sand and clay uh, with an incredible level of, of alluvium um, uh, that makes it such a rich uh, uh, place to grow agriculture. Um, here you have kind of the districts of UP and then here I've placed again all of the irrigated areas within each of those districts so you get a sense of just uh, breaking that down even more in terms of what I could find from census data. Now the formation of that supersurface is very much tied to the Ganga Canal and other heroic projects. The Ganga Canal uh, was constructed uh, or first opened in 1854, its first branch which stretched all the way from uh, uh, through uh, the Ganga uh, uh, Jamuna Doab all the way ultimately to Kanpur uh, where it terminated. Uh, initially it was supposed to go all the way to Allahabad but didn't make it that way until the lower Ganges Canal in the later half of the, uh, the 19th century. But when it was uh, completed, in, or the first leg of it in 1854, it was 854 miles long. It was the longest canal system that was ever uh, built uh, in uh, human history and also uh, one of the most monumental public works projects. Today it measures over 12,000 kilometers long and it wasn't only just uh, a kind of uh, engineering feat in terms of the infrastructure to put it in place, but it was ultimately supposed to replace the diffuse or decentralized uh, modes of irrigating the Ganga Jamuna Dawab. Now the, the, the argument was was that the British were coming in, or the East India Company, they were coming in, they were um, uh, extracting resources, particularly agriculture, and yet there was a growing profundity of, of famine that was happening. So the argument was rather than having people uh, be able to um, control their, their water, oftentimes groundwater, uh, through technologies like uh, the Persian wheel and, and others, uh, or say the mod instead, uh, they proposed to create a large centralized system that would replace all of these infrastructures so that they could exert greater control and supposedly famine relief, but also so that uh, they could expand the reach of the, of the Ganga's waters uh, to irrigating more of the Ganga Jamuna Dwab. They uh, not only had to create the longest aqueduct uh, in the world up until the late uh, 19th century, like the Solani Canal that passes over the Solani Nadi um, near Roki, but they continued to extend that and have it intersect with uh, uh, railways um, over time so that this infrastructure was never just thought of as a monofunctional infrastructure, was but part of a much larger system.
to then also creating the uh, headworks for the lower Ganga Canal at Narora uh, that was built in the late 19th century. And this supersurface, uh, the development of it, going from the 1830s with the Yamuna canals all the way up to uh, the present, you can see the infilling that happens in the Ganga Jamuna Doab from uh, the 1830s all the way to the present in terms of the extension of this canal system, which only continues to grow uh, to this day. And as I mentioned before, it starts at Hardwar, which uh, you can see in this aerial photograph at the bottom here, uh, it bifurcates uh, from the Ganga at Hardwar and then passes through. Uh, this canal system, because of the, the nature of the topography, it has to sometimes uh, go underneath uh, rivers, like you can see in this satellite image here at the bottom where the actual canals are passing beneath uh, a river, the Ranipur Rao. Um, here are some photographs of that. So here you have the river actually passing above the canal system. And again here, you can kind of just also see the way in which th one of the reasons they don't want this river system to pass into the canals because the, the level of silt and debris that's passing from the river not to get into the canal system to um, gunk up the works. So then the infrastructure that has to be put in place to try to slow down the boulders and debris that come down with the monsoon as well. And this is all the same kind of super passage that's constructed to then the Solani Aqueduct before it then enters into the landscape. But this uh, system of the, of the canal system, it was never just thought of as being purely an irrigation uh, infrastructure, but instead was always thought of in section as well, where here it's drawn where shops were to flank the edges stairs or gots to come down to it to both use it uh, for drawing water, for bathing, for, uh, for washing uh, clothes, etc., to then also for irrigation. So while it was oftentimes spoken about and historicized to this day as a kind of irrigation machine, it had a much larger um, uh, set of uses. And here you can also see in terms of the, the section in relationship to the plan, uh, in terms of the berms and the supposed plantations that were to mark its edges. And while it, it was thought to also create uh, irrigation, it also inscribes an order into the landscape. So here is a, a, a terminal line of the Itawa branch, uh, and you can see these Raj Buhas that are uh, coming off of it as kind of chevrons that start to then organize the space. And what the, the canal system does is it takes uh, spaces and by rationing them more and, and making them smaller and smaller, they're actually able to then exponentially increase the value, supposed value of these lands in terms of their agricultural production over time. So it creates an almost kind of urban agrarian grid in this landscape. Um, and it was not only by the uh, early 20th century uh, for irrigation, for mixed use, but it also becomes part of uh, a system of hydroelectric uh, power plants that were to then uh, power two boils. This being one of them uh, in um, just a past or below Rurki, it's no longer a power station, instead it's more of a space for uh, quadrupeds and, and lovers to come to. But what's um, interesting is that this, this power station was supposed to take the falls of the Ganga Canal, produce electricity to power tube wells uh, within this landscape in the middle of the 20th century. And what that does is it transforms the, the, the Ganga Canal or the Ganga uh, to not just being uh, purely water, but also transforms its state into producing electricity. So it even expands that kind of urban agrarian grid of the canal and its reach even further. And the canal, even when it, say, it passes through Kanpur, is this uh, uh, postcard from the uh, early 20th century shows that it was also, because of the silt that accumulates uh, within the canal, it was also a fantastic place for grazing. As well. So this uh, this irrigation uh, track was also a space for uh, animal husbandry. And today, of course, it passes through cities like Kanpur and many others, not just as kind of these uh, bucolic agricultural spaces, but even through the, uh, through the periphery of, uh, of Kanpur and even through its center in parts. And today then concludes at Allahabad. Now, I, I, for the last half of the lecture, what I'd like to do is really focus on the maps that I had to make in a particular between Allahabad and Varanasi using and drawing upon the lessons that I learned both from the kind of archival work I was doing, but also uh, just past where the Gung 
Canal System ends, uh, mapping this territory of Allahabad and Varanasi for several reasons. One, because uh, there are two kind of regional capitals uh, that are of great significance within uh, UP. Also because uh, Allahabad is where Grand Trunk Road, or what's now part of the Golden Quadrilateral, passes or go crosses the Ganga and connects uh, Varanasi. Within us, and then below it, you have a series of national highways and the Great Deccan Road that connects to Mirzapur. Mapping this territory, both its cities and this area in between, uh, using a single solar cycle. So, I'm going to posit that there is a notion of a bound city and an unbound city, and I want to use these two categories to really undermine each other. So if the bound city is this kind of political entity of a city, like when we say Allahabad or Varanasi, we think that it has a certain uh, boundary to it. The unbound then is this area that exists in between these two, and I want to show how actually obsolete both of these techniques are by actually using them to describe these two spaces. So this is a drawing that I did of Allahabad uh, from 2005 through 2006. And this is the city of Allahabad, uh, 2006. This is, because I had no maps of this area, I had to actually do all the surveying of this city by myself. So this is all drawn by me from scratch. And what I do is I not only kind of map out the, the hard edges, say, of the urban settlement that exists there and all the roadways, but then I also map the transformation of the Ganga and the Yamuna rivers uh, over the course of a single solar cycle. So those dark purple, like you see here with the Yamuna or here in the Ganga, this is uh, just before when the monsoon arrives. The, the water, I mean, it's the, the river really is understood as a kind of line. It's something you can easily walk across. And by the end of the monsoon, you start to see how the river expands by several kilometers. So this expansion and contraction, trying to map that out, how it happens over time, and the ways in which, say, uh, the city of Allahabad's edges are very different, defined very differently along the Ganga, say, versus the Yamuna, which have, historically has been where most of the settlement has happened. Here you have Akbar Kila and then uh, the Sangam itself right here. Now, uh, this is a kind of zoomed in version, even more. You can start to see the settlement, but not just the settlement, but also the kind of tanks and lakes that exist within the city, as well as the expansion and contraction of the of the that exist within it as well. But if you imagine I take that plan of the city and I rotate it 90 degrees, and uh, I photograph over the course of a year, say those Limburg brother drawings that I showed you, I stand right here to site Akbar Kila, and I take photographs as a kind of panorama over the course of the year, so that I'm not only mapping how this uh, Ganga uh, river system extends and contracts over time, but I'm also in cartographic space, but I'm doing it in terms of photography as well. So there are a set of photographs that all relate to those colors of purple that you saw before. So um, I'll kind of walk through uh, what that means. So this is a single solar cycle. This is that solar cycle unwrapped into a straight line, and each of those purple colors that you saw are indexed here in relationship to the photographs. So this is at the time of Magh Mela, which is January, February. One's going on right now in Allahabad. And what I do is I place these photographs in relationship to drawing what's happening or the activity that's happening on the ground. So this is the cultivated lands that exist within this one meter by one meter space, um, the roadways that exist, the settlement uh, and then the, the kind of the temporary settlement or people that are uh, being housed at this site. What happens is, is that that city is abandoned, uh, the, the tents are taken up, the t grid of the tat or the tattoo of the city still exists as roadways, but those roadways are then transformed into agriculture. So this is the exact same spot just a few months later. There's no one there except farmers who are uh, using the lines of that city uh, for spaces of agriculture. So this is over the course of 2005, 2006. And those spaces uh, get cultivated more. You start to see that the monsoon is arriving, harvesting uh, has already begun. And then uh, by the end of it, again, this is all the same space. All of that area, you can see both in the photographs at the top and also in those diagrams below, is completely subsumed by the monsoon. So there's an incredible intelligence about the this space is used both for agriculture and for a city, and it's this cyclical process that happens.
particular year, that's a kind of microcosm of happens all along the river. And of course, while this area hasn't, or this region hadn't been mapped in about 50 years, these kinds of processes never make it into the kind of official cartographic representations of a space like this. And yet I think they're incredibly invaluable in terms of thinking how we might organize space in relationship to time, particularly in terms of the cycles of the monsoon and of the solar cycle in general. So bringing those cartographic, photographic methods of representation onto a single picture plane so that you can better image this area and hopefully make more attuned decisions uh, both in terms of development and design terms of engineering. And so here are just some panoramas of those areas. Here from the Kumela 2013. Right. What's great about getting to share this with all of you is that I don't have to tell you what all this means like with a bunch of Firungis in terms of uh, the significance of this. You are all quite well aware of this. Um, uh, the kind of these are a set of photos of the infrastructure thing of Etc. in 2005, 2006 for Mag Mela at Allahabad. And here are the spaces that I showed you before that are now uh, being used for agriculture. The groundwater table level is so high that you can just dig uh, well to be able to irrigate these areas and create kind of little micro, kind of microclimates, but also agricultural plots within what used to be that tent. So these are the footprints of the tents, so the roadway which those lines then are, are used and abused before they're completely washed away and this happens every year. So of course, that it then is used at the level of recreation, uh, uh, pujas that are happening here, not to mention the amount of animal husbandry that takes place within this area. This kind of mixed use, um, if ever there was a kind of model of mixed use, I would say it really is this, uh, this area. And then it's also uh, a space that's uh, uh, extracted in terms of its uh, sand for uh, the concrete industry within the area. Uh, just the changes that take place uh, in the of the riverbeds. Um, here. Not a whole lot of change in terms of railway infrastructure with a few exceptions. Settlement is fascinating because settlement has changed. So there's a densification that's definitely happening in the old city, but also in the British uh, or civil lines that uh, once existed, which is kind of now the, the heart of the government of it, uh, where Allahabad is. But also the level of expansion that's happening all throughout here in terms of actual uh, paka uh, uh, housing. These are not temporary, but are in fact staying there. And then agriculture that's mostly been pushed to the edges of the Ganga, very little along the Yamuna, just because it's, um, the soils are not as rich and uh, to extract water is a little bit more difficult because it has a much lower water table level. And also the increase of um, tanks and lakes. Most of these tanks and lakes that you see here, especially in the 2006, they're mostly the from water logging. Uh, than actually from intentionally being constructed. But it's actually the proliferation of these tube wells. Uh, you can see the 1956, and it's, you probably can't see it that well, but the level of tube well infrastructure, these constellations or galaxies of tube wells that exist all throughout this area is radically transforming this area and is what allows for this kind of diffuse urbanization that's taking place in this area, this kind of mosaic that's not only putting pressures on water, in some of these areas, but also putting tremendous pressures on land, both for agriculture, but also for industry, for housing, for retail, etc. So the tube well introduces a completely different factor in the way that this area uh, is functioning. <laughs> 
And here, just another set of drawings of the, of the changes of uh, Allahabad uh, just over the course of that single solar cycle. Now, I started talking about the kind of edges of Allahabad, and it's now that unbound city that I want to draw your attention to. And in the same way that I was doing this, uh, this uh, measuring of time and how, uh, how the space changes over time using a solar cycle, I do the same for these transects. So those same colors of purple that you saw before for Allahabad, I use those uh, for the transects as well. And so these are those six transects that you see here. I use those and I start to show you how, the, it, just within those transects, uh, there's myriad numbers of the ways in which the uh, Ganga River uh, expresses herself. So you find both kind of uh, thin lines versus stains and splotches. It reveals a whole other set of imprints of the river just in, in, in these six transects, the ways in which then roadways uh, uh, cut across these transects, the level of settlement that exists within these transects, and again, like I didn't use uh, satellite photography or anything for these, I, I did these all by uh, foot and by car. Um, you can see that there's quite a diffuse amount of urban settlement that's happening here. Here you have the city of Mirzapur to kind of give you, to orient you a little bit. Here's the edge of Allahabad and then Varanasi is just over here uh, with Chunar right here. There's a diffuse kind of urbanization that's taking place here, but if you look, look at all of the tanks and lakes that are in each of those six transects. You'll notice that on the three on the left, there's quite a few spread out across uh, those transects, but on the right, there are very few of those, especially in the fourth and fifth ones. And even more so in terms of the canals and irrigation systems and nalas that exist within these areas, there are actually very few within those three uh, on the right. Yet it has diff this almost a similar kind of uh, diffuse kind of urbanization that's taking place or settlement pattern. And what I argue is that most of these areas are being uh, serviced by tube wells. And it's not just these areas in these, uh, th these hamlets and villages and uh, uh, second and third tier towns, but it's also even in cities like Mirzapur, in Allahabad, Varanasi, where people have sunk their own tube wells because municipal water systems cannot uh, provide ample water or clean water for them on, on a regular basis. So in some ways, the provision of infrastructure for uh, tube wells is almost the same in cities even greater in uh, the countryside for this uh, technology that was originally uh, applauded or, or, or um, praised for its uh, participation in the Green Revolution. You find it now uh, within not just these six transects, but all throughout the basin and through much of, of India and, and, and South Asia at large. I won't talk too much about these drawings that I make of um, of these different transects, but in the vein of trying to hallucinate more about them, I start to picture them not just in terms of their planimetric uh, spaces and the way they change over time, but also in section using um, a, fall uh, a mechanism that I developed in 2002-2003, where what I do is it's a machine that I developed or an apparatus that uh, takes the fallway, which is the deepest point of a river, uh, say like this line that exists here and draws lines perpendicular to that edge to be able to map the geometries of a river in relationship to its Thalweg to better um, uh, visualize the spatial changes that happen in section and in plan. So that you can then, using that technique, you can start to map over time how, say, soils get deposited in water flows that happen throughout it. And I, uh, that same technique that I developed in the early 2000s, I then take to um, to, the, to the six transects that I developed. So if you imagine that this is that first transect that I showed you, this red line that passes through here is the fallway, which is the deepest uh, uh, kind of line of, uh, within the valley of the, of the river. These lettered lines that you see here, A through J, are all running perpendicular to the edge of the river. Now imagine if that line was a piece of string with hard or kind of dowels that pass through it. And so if I take that red string with those uh, rods passing through it and I straighten it, this is the form or the array that those uh, lines would take if I straighten that river. So I can start to index the curvature of the river in plan and then place it in relationship to the section like I show right here. So this is 
B and C of those sections. It's a little hard to see probably where you're at, but this is the Ganga at its, uh, at its, at its uh, lowest point, and this is how much it expands in the course of a year in relationship to those geometries. And so you start to then pick up uh, how the geometry is related to its depth and to its uh, flow. And I, it, what it allows for then is to take all of those six transects that have those kind of wily geometries and actually straighten them so you can start to compare and contrast them and better understand how you might organize development, uh, future development that might happen in these areas while still maintaining the dynamism of the river. And so then this is a kind of another hallucination on that where the small white vertical lines that you see, um, sorry they're not so clear, those are actually one meter changes in elevation in relationship to uh, the, um, the array that's indexing the curvature of the river. And then zooming in even further with taking that notion of the transect um, that I developed with the larger transect, like you see here, this was that second transect, zooming in to take an even smaller transect here, using the same a uh, method of the solar cycle as a way to map out changes so you can see both how the, the bed of the river expands and contracts over time in terms of its volume of water, but also the way that that affects the groundwater table level and then the provisions of infrastructure that exist in terms of roadways, human settlement, cultivated lands. And then these were all of the hand pumps and tube wells that I could count in that area, which that's two, six kilometers uh, uh, by one kilometer. Um, those spaces. You can see the level of groundwater extraction that's happening even in an area that has an expansion and contraction of the Ganga like that. And I, I map these soils not only by kind of, or these soils these not only by going out and, and photographing them, but I also had to develop my own machines or techniques for that. So this is a surface accumulation sleeve that I developed. It's a prosthetic that one wears to take uh, soil, surface soil samples and uh, it's plotted in with a GPS, so it's triangulated satellites so that you can start to map the soils um, uh, one kilometer perpendicular to the edge of the river, uh, this being an imprint of that surface accumulation sleeve. Uh, it was a lot of fun because from uh, villages and even in cities would come out and help me kind of take these imprints and it became a kind of really participatory uh, exercise to then being able to compare those bands of uh, soils, and this is a kind of zoomed in version of being able to compare uh, the kind of silt versus the harder soils that exist within this area so that you can not only map how the space changes over time uh, at a kind of celestial uh, and even say regional scale, but all the way down to the actual soil structures themselves. So trying to really get a thick uh, description and, and uh, visualization of this area. If that wasn't enough, uh, I, because I didn't know that if I would be able to smuggle those uh, surface accumulation sleeve uh, pieces in, I also developed, because I wanted to do some chemical testing on these soils and I didn't really have access to it uh, while I was uh, on the Fulbright, I uh, developed what I called the Gunga dip sock method, where what I would do was um, I, would, I bought like a hundred pairs of these really uh, pristine white uh, Mickey and Minnie Mouse socks that I would wear uh, and I would do these Gunga dips where basically I was taking, I was absorbing the soils into, um, into these white socks and then uh, I packed them into my suitcase. I have over a hundred of them and so the United States Department of Agriculture found, the lar I mean those rolls that I got were like this big of the surface accumulation sleeve if they somehow found those and took those away from me, at least I would have these socks. And if anybody asked, well, why do you have all of these dirty socks? I could just say I was some dirty backpacker, right, that was doing this work. And no one would think otherwise of it. So trying to develop also, you know, hallucinate a little bit on how, like, I can actually move things in and out and also uh, map this area uh, with the kind of um, limited means that I had while I was trying to do all of this in, in a year. And I kind of pull back a little bit from that kind of more humorous side of the work was, I think that the, this drawing uh, encapsulates in many ways the changes that I see taking place in this area in terms of infrastructure. You, and brings all of those layers that I was telling you about before in terms of infrastructure, in terms of the, uh, the uh, solar cycle, where 
if I, if I look at different pieces of infrastructure, and I call a river an infrastructure, a nala, a pond, tank, lake, canal, and water pumps, you can see the kinds of settlement patterns that oftentimes happen in, say, a one kilometer by one kilometer area in terms of a river, in terms of a, of a nala, right, where they're kind of keeping their distance so it can expand and contract. It's a little bit tightening up in terms of ponds and lakes. Canal systems tend to also be somewhat, uh, I mean, they, they do cluster, but it's really in relationship to the tube well that you see here where this kind of diffuse uh, uh, pattern starts to take place of settlement. And it's really what is producing this mosaic effect in the area. And part of that has to do with um, the fact that uh, when you can sink a tube well in an area where sometimes you have water table levels that are not even uh, a meter below grade, you can sink a tube well and you can set up shop just about in any of these areas in terms of agriculture, in terms of industry, in terms of domestic spaces. And even though many of these areas don't have regular access to electricity, they oftentimes rely on a diesel powered tube well. And I talk a lot about in the book about the switch from electric to diesel and how that's not only changed the landscape environmentally, but also its economics and access um, to water that I won't go into greater detail here. But what's actually happening is, is that in many parts, especially of eastern UP through Bihar, you don't actually have so much an issue of access or, or of, uh, of the supply of water. It's actually the supply of land that's actually um, growing smaller and smaller in terms of uh, the, the, the pressures that are being placed upon it as a kind of scarce resource. And these pumps, of course, they go from the very small to then the advertisement find here under uh, the golden quadrilateral when it was being constructed to then the ubiquity of pumps, which these were introduced, especially after uh, partition as a temporary means of providing water in places like Delhi and Northern India uh, to deal with uh, the rapid uh, influx of, of, of of people migrating um, from Pakistan, yet they became a kind of permanent fixture, not just in cities, but also in the countryside, like you find there, in these tube wells advertisements, even though they're oftentimes photographed or are, are painted as uh, part of bucolic landscape. This is one of the few that I was allowed to photograph um, in situ. You also, they're oftentimes found almost everywhere in a kind of housed in a, in a building like this, and the only way that you know that a tube well is probably in there is because of the sound and also because of the pipe running out. Uh, but those tube wells oftentimes feed off of canal systems as well uh, because these canals, as I was mentioning before, raise water table levels. And even in a place like you see here uh, with this um, you know, uh, thatched roof and everything, there's a, a diesel-powered tube well that's operating there. To again, the kind of ubiquity of the hand pump, the diesel-powered pumps, hand pumps being placed strategically next to uh, surface water, and then of course also within cities. And I, I, I didn't get to put this in the book, nor I won't talk about it too much today, but what I found also, along with tracking the river, I would follow water buffalo and uh, cow, cows uh, 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 within these cities quite a bit, because there was a greater concentration of water buffalo and cows, especially in places like Allahabad and Varanasi than even in the countryside because the inability of, of, uh, of transporting milk um, and other dairy goods into the city um, in terms of infrastructure, you have larger concentrations of cows and water buffalo in these cities than outside of them. And because of the way the municipal uh, refuse system is set up, that of course these are all feeding off of the refuse in the streets uh, because there's actually more for them uh, both uh, to feed off here but also so that they're closer to their customers. And so you have a greater influx over time of cow uh, and water buffalo wallas coming in uh, to these cities uh, that are radically transforming them, in some ways turning them more bucolic than even the supposed countryside which is becoming even more and more hyper-engineered in terms of these diffuse systems. So there's in a strange way almost a kind of return to the decentralized uh, system that the Ganga Canal was trying to replace and there's a layering that takes place in this landscape that has yet to really be uh, imaged and I think visualized in a way that's of use to the plans going forward. And that, that layering, uh, there are also hybrids that happen like the Naranpur pumping canal system uh, outside Chunar. And to give you a sense of how tall this structure is, this is a, uh, this fellow standing here is five foot five. 
uh, tall. Uh, this is all being pumped from the, the Ganga to uh, service uh, southeastern uh, UP and northern uh, Madhya Pradesh. Um, here's a map of that. Uh, canal system and it's uh, just expanse that exists of, of transforming the river again where you don't have a gravity flow like with the Ganga Canal to using these pumping stations. And so what I try to do in this, this dynamic atlas is bring together these different scales all the way from the scales of soils all the way to the kind of regional and celestial scales to try to build a map or a, a, a way of modeling space and how it changes over time that can hopefully be of use to the efforts underway to both clean up the Ganga, but also to address the, 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 the infrastructural questions that, that are extremely pressing beyond just the actual riverbed itself to better understand how the expanse of the Ganga goes well beyond the, purely the riverbed itself, but as part of a much larger watershed and water basin. And I think with that, I'll end it and uh, open it up for questions. Thanks. Sahil, uh, first would be a one word question, how? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> like, I'm just astounded by the level of detail that you've captured. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, it's probably very dense. It doesn't seem that dense to me. I feel like I'm skimming a lot, but it's probably too dense. So. Yeah. No, but it was quite, quite helpful. Um, uh, wh one question, it's not even a question actually. It's more like, uh, one is an observation that uh, I found this very the way you captured the tubeville as a decentralized source of water and also you know something that changes the landscape and then you also you know draw the parallel <coughs> that diesel also does the same thing in, in some ways you know like the centralized electricity and then diesel al allows those what you know tubewells to operate separately and mm -hmm. kind of mushroom out so that that well that was that seemed interesting the water energy nexus there and uh, secondly uh, something that i wanted to kind of you know, with you reflect on would be, would be the fact that we were doing some research on land record management in India and especially one of the these edges that could not be captured in any recording system turned out to be these riverbeds and, you know, drain, I mean, all these boundaries which you cannot capture and cannot be in any way uh, uh, at least captured in a static way, whereas you through your dynamic map uh, Atlas and this mapping project have, have somehow in some way kind of created a way uh, of being able to analyze and also you know in some way record uh, not not maybe in the standard conception of maybe a physical map but but through this kind of a dynamic atlas which combines the photographic and the cartographic and even other mm -hmm. so so I, I mean I'm, I'm just thinking that thinking out loud that how, how would you see this and, and since you mentioned the pressures on land also I mean how do you see that interacting with how the land is owned or you know occupied and how is it I mean I, I see something but I'm not able to and maybe with the kind of breadth and depth you've gone into I think probably you could help me out there in some way well uh, I mean that's a great question, or you're asking me to kind of hallucinate a little bit more upon the work, or at least, and when, when I say hallucinate, it's really to try to be vivid. Um, I mean, the, the kind of land tenureship, the, the land rights in these areas are, of course, extremely complex um, uh, on a lot of levels. And something that really, even since independence, uh, has been something that the central government and the state governments have been very reluctant to pursue too much other than consolidating certain lands. And UP was actually, it's interesting because it's one of the last to really consolidate most of its land holdings, which by that I mean, you know, some, you might own a piece of land here and over here and they're not contiguous, right? So trying to, to do all of that. So that, that has proven extremely difficult, but also because of 
uh, the English common law system that's existed in India, like in the US and like many commonwealth countries with the exception of Canada and Quebec, uh, you, for the most part, own your property both two-dimensionally but almost all the way to right the core of the earth. Other than, I mean, there are issues, right, with minerals, etc. I'm being dramatic there. But you own the groundwater. And uh, that creates all kinds of issues because of uh, people drawing groundwater and having to go deeper and deeper and aquifers being depleted, especially more in Western UP than, say, Eastern UP. But it, it also creates a kind of camouflaging that takes place here because people don't want you to know that they have tube wells. Uh, so there's also not a kind of conversation that's happening other than when the, tab when the water table levels are dropping so low that you have to pay a lot of money to dig deeper. That's actually causing people to have conversations and come together. What I, what I try to, the metaphor I guess that I use to, to understand the tube well is that it's in many ways, the tube well in terms of urban growth is very similar to what the elevator was to Manhattan. And here's why, because it, from most places you don't want to build something more than three stories if you don't have a tube well because it really is a pain uh, to have to carry water up or because of just, I mean, the, the amount of infrastructure you'd have to be put in place to kind of pump the water up in a lot of these areas uh, it's just not viable. So in some ways the p tube well or, or the inability to have access to it is a limiting factor in terms of height. So in the New York Times op-ed that I wrote uh, in some time back now, and ultimately they, they got cut, but what I was looking at was how you could start to reimagine planning and zoning in, t uh, in section as opposed to plan. So if you start to then allocate uh, space and development in relationship to both uh, height, but also areas for groundwater recharge so that you could start to better connect surface water with groundwater and monitoring. And of course, uh, I was just in Hong Kong and people were saying, but what do you do in a kind of weekend state uh, system? And uh, of course, it's, uh, it's, it's not an easy one, but I think at least at a kind of policy level, changes need to start to happen that account for that kind of cycle of water recharge at a much more uh, local and intimate level that can be part of a larger system so that you can still keep the decentralized but also make it a mixed use in terms of the centralized because I think while there's such a kind of rhetoric today of praising uh, decentralization I also think it leads to a lot of problems as well because you also need to have a dialogue and there does need to be some some level of oversight or at least so that you can make connections that are uh, in terms of the issues that are taking place so that everybody's not operating in the dark I mean there was someone at a conference, at the ISOLA conference, who was celebrating decentralization as this great thing of the 21st century. Well, actually, uh, decentralization was really part of, you know, Mahala Nobis's, uh second five-year plan and many other plans that followed that uh, I think uh, were incredibly hard to implement because, one, the monitoring of it is incredibly difficult. And so I think you need a mixture of kind of centralized and decentralized systems. And the sectional perspective is, I think, an interesting one to try to relate those better, both kind of the cyclical changes but also the spatial dynamics that exist there, instead of just always thinking of property in 2D when so many people are really understanding it in three dimensions and even in many ways four outside of, say, the kind of major metro areas. I mean, the city of Delhi must, the estimates are probably around 500,000 privately owned tube wells that occupy, that, that operate within the city, and it's probably even higher. So I think, uh, it's impossible to try to go in, shut them all down, or to map all of them, but if you can start to model them and also try to change the way we think about further development, that you can hopefully use these maps and I think um, in a manner that's, that's useful to further development, that's only going to create greater pressures on these areas. That was a really long-winded answer and uh, maybe went a little bit too to the morass of uh, policy, but... I could hear it, fine, yeah. <laughs> 
Firstly, I'm interested in the tensions between man and nature. Um, when you describe it, because you could also describe nature as a machine. So how do you, I mean, does this, what informed your decision to call it the Ganga water machine? That's my question. Well, so I, I like the, 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 the so the, it's a great question because I'm very interested in conflating nature and culture because I think it's a false divide. And I think in a context like this where so much is being shaped by people but also by meteorological systems, by watersheds that come from the Himalayas that introduce geological time, that I think the conflation of that is really uh, productive. And also, I think what even makes it more kind of complex, and somebody told me they thought it would add some level of, um, of uh, uh, um, not conspiracy, uh, provocation that might raise some, ra raise some uh, eyebrows, is that also uh, that, you know, Gunga also refers to a goddess, right? Or to a deity. So I'm, I'm very interested in the way, in this kind of contrapuntal way of thinking that I think is very Indian to begin with, uh, if, if I had to kind of essentialize it, but also because I think that in a context like this, subdividing nature and culture, I think, leads doesn't lead very far. And I think environmental historians and historians of science uh, have shown the ways in which that nature-culture divide is quite, is quite false. And a, a great book that precedes this by quite a few years is Richard White's The Organic Machine that looks at the Columbia River and the ways in which people even in the 19th century are speaking about uh, the Columbia River as a kind of organic machine. So I, I like to think of this machine as kind of living, and you're right, they're industrial machines, efficiency, but we also know that machines can be incredibly inefficient, like political machines, right, that can, I mean, uh, uh, I, I, I don't have to wax about that for very long to, for you, that to be incredibly vis, uh, you know, um, uh, palpable for you, um, both here and, and, and elsewhere. So I can definitely say in my country for sure. So I think that uh, the conflation of that for me is extremely productive in this, in, this area, in the same way that I find it useful to both call, uh, call these rivers uh, and nalas by their names, but also like a martial artist try to use those uh, to turn them in on themselves, to really expand the conversation about what, consti what constitutes a river, what constitutes water. Is groundwater actually a river system or is it uh, some other kind of body of water? I think conflating those terms is actually useful in a context like this where they're so jumbled together already. Uh, yeah, thanks for the talk. Uh, I was curious, I mean, you've, you've talked a little bit about uh, the spread of the borewell and, you know, the dispersed nature of urbanization in that sort of entire uh, river basin area. Uh, I mean, if you look at other infrastructures, like if you look at the railways um, and you look in that region and you compare it to the rest of the country, you also find a very high density over there. Um, so I was curious in your sort of some of your historical archival research, have you sort of overlaid it with other infrastructures and seen those relationships and, I mean, causality would be stretching it way too far, but, sure. uh, you know, <laughs> just, just relationships and, and what was going on. Well, so, um, one of the things that I, I talk about uh, in the book is, the look, uh, is to look at kind of the, the drain and debt uh, that's created under the Raj, um, uh, by the British Raj, where uh, railways, um, are turned into famine relief infrastructures in a way that canals ultimately were not by the second half of the 19th century and especially well into the 20th because the British government uh, uh, ensured railways an, you know, an X percentage of profit no matter what happened to them in a way that canals were not. So uh, the canals and the railways are actually highly intertwined in say this portion of northern India, which you're right, has quite a l long stretch of, of railway systems. What I look at, especially in terms of its contemporary uses, is how do you start to laminate those infrastructures of, of river, of canal, of railway, of roadways, not thinking of them as monofunctional, which I've tried to show sometimes they weren't always thought that way, but they definitely at times, especially with the railway boom uh, in northern India in the late 19th century certainly were, that uh, how do you laminate those so that they can have synergies and feed off of one another in ways people are already doing that, but hone in on that more so that you can uh, 
I think develop new urban and housing typologies as well as uh, kind of better spatial models that integrate these infrastructures and these cycles of uses and water uh, into one another. Um, you know, the, I, think, uh, I, th I think braiding those things together, especially again of the density and thinking of those as part of the Ganges water machine as well, or the Ganges machine, is, it could be extremely productive, but of course are also extremely difficult given the way that minister, ministries are set up as well, right? So, I mean, uh, the last time I was at Water Resources and Ganga Rejuvenation in October, I think we counted for one of the projects that I was pitching to them of, of, of uh, developing soft infrastructures for wetlands that it must have overlapped with five or six ministries just in terms of trying to do that. So uh, it's extremely difficult even at a kind of political level, but um, I mean, uh, part of doing all that archival work was to try to reconstruct how the, the layers of this landscape, but also how you might start to use them um, over time, which is, I guess, a little bit different than your hedging away from causality, but um, uh, you're right that the, the, the railways uh, transformed both cities and towns that passed through them, but also all of, the, all of the land that was owned along them and still does to this day. I'd love to hear somebody tell me they think this is complete, you know, complete bachfas, and I can't believe that I spent 10 years of my life. To, it's really okay. My mother thinks it was stupid of me to do it, so. <coughs> well, I, I really didn't know it would take me 10 years. I really thought it would take me a year. <laughs> <laughs> Right, if there aren't any more questions or comments, we'll wrap it up over here. Thank you again, uh, Anthony, for being here and presenting your work. And I uh, look forward to seeing more of you for our upcoming public events. Thanks. Thanks.